All right, what's up, guys? This is episode 50 of the Master of One podcast. Um, episode 50, Georgia State Champion. So I won the state championship this past weekend. I'm going to go through that as well as some other stuff. Um, but let me get right into it. So basically, I went four and a half out of five. Uh, four, won the first four rounds and then drew Ethan Sheehan in the last round. Um, I actually had been calling this from the beginning. I said, okay, look, we're both going to go four to four because... Let's be honest, we're just kind of the best there. And then uh, we're going to play in the last round, and we'll see what happens. Um, Didn't end up playing a very long game. Um, We ended up drawing about six moves. Um, But let me go round by round, and uh, I will get to this this game. So round one, I played Eric Wang. Um, It was my first time playing the Gruny. So that was pretty fun. Honestly, opening was kind of sus, but that is one thing with... The Grunfeld, um, it's always complicated, is a good way to put it. Though sometimes it can be uh, kind of drawish, just because a lot of pieces get traded. But this is one, I think, pretty cool thing with the Grunfeld, is a lot of times you're going to get two rooks, a queen, and one piece. Or two rooks, a queen, and two pieces. And even though that's not many pieces, the positions get pretty dynamic. And there's always like a lot of stuff going on. So... Basically, out of the opening, um, I would say, I mean, it was equal. I wouldn't, I'm not going to say that I was, like, worse, but it was equal, and it was kind of easy for him to play, I would say. Um, but then he basically got his king kind of sus, and once the attack got going, man, it did not stop. Um, it was literally actually what I said. It was two rooks, queen, and opposite color bishops, um, and he had a, a weak king. And honestly, the combination is going to be pretty sick. So definitely check out the, the YouTube video with the tournament recap because um, uh, that's one of those highlights. Like, you got a whole music video too. So that was pretty cool. Uh, round two, I ended up whipping out the B3 Cecil against Eric Tik- <laughs> Eric Tichenko, but it's kind of spelled Tikachenko. T K A C H E N K O. So, uh, him and William Remick, the GOAT, have uh, some beef. Um, and basically Remick was really rooting for me to win this game um, and then even during the game or I think it was after the game Tichenko was like yo is Remick, does Remick hate me or something like that and he was like what did he say and I was like nah you chilling it was something else um, but <laughs> that was kind of funny um, but basically the game what happened and honestly it's just very unfortunate for him so basically there's two moves they, they low key look the same but unfortunately, one of them, uh, one of the moves, he's fine, and I have to do a lot of work. And the other move, he basically gets murdered. Um, he gets, I mean, basically it's a tactic and everything falls apart. Um, now, one interesting thing about the opening was I was so fixed on one idea that I actually missed another idea that, that kind of just wins, like, very early on. Um, it just looked like I should be trying to get this, but... Because I was so pigeonholed into making this work, I completely missed an idea that just works. And then um, he would just be stuck, and I'd be plus one, and plus one in counting. So um, that was kind of an oversight by me, um, but ended up kind of cruising that game. Uh, round three, I played Carter Peatman. Um, so this game was interesting. Um, so the opening, I started playing well, and then I was just being stupid. Like... I played it well up to a point, and it was, it's just one of those positions where it's very thug life, very, like, I would say weird is maybe a good way to put it, is, or just not straightforward. Um, <laughs> you could say open to interpretation. Um, and basically, I, I just pushed my H pawn and got just a very ghetto position. Um, and then he, I think, uh, kind of just like how I was talking about that in the last game, how I was so fixed on trying to make an ideal work that I missed something, and... Um, he, I could have just been winning. I think he was so fixed on this tactic that he thought was just going to knock me out. Um, that after I kind of survived the tactic, I weathered the storm. Um, I'm not. I mean, I wasn't better by any means, but basically, I wasn't just like worse. I was. Like, I think he was basically just plus one, like just no problem plus one, and then um, essentially it got equal. And then it's funny. Like it looks like he's winning material. It looks like he's winning an exchange, but. I happily just sacrificed the exchange. I have two bishops, and I think very shortly after, I kind of everything falls apart. 
Um, one thing I did do, I think, kind of well was I played pretty fast. Didn't really get in time pressure. Um, and then basically, once I had weathered the storm and had a slightly better position, he also was in pretty extreme time pressure. Um, and that kind of just like culminated in just a tactic where his king is uh, very weak. Um, I, th I will say, I think once I stopped playing bad, I played pretty good. <laughs> like Once I was not making weird, s sketchy moves, um, I think I played very accurate. Um, I found the right move order to take away his counterplay. Um, and then kind of just like uh, break through on his king side. So that was good. Uh, round four, I played Andrew Zhang, um, very frequent customer customer of mine. Um, but he played well. Like he, I basically I played my god opening, and um, he did a really good job of. Uh, he did a really good job of not. I mean, I guess playing the opening the right way. He played he played a line that no one else has played before, um, and it's honestly like a pretty good one. Um, I mean, I still got like a pretty decent position out of the opening, and basically what what ended up happening was it was three pieces, two rooks, and six pawns versus three pieces, two rooks, and and six pawns, and um, I essentially um, just played very active. I would say um, he kind of threatened to take the bishop pair, but then I get activity, um, and then he realized he can't really take it because my activity is strong. And then he, he basically is just in trouble. Um, and then, okay, like, I think I hesitated a bit during this game just because it's, it's a weird position. My king is very sus. Um, but eventually, like, uh, I push him back. He, okay, so basically it, it breaks down to he made one backwards move, and then I really just took over on the initiative. Like, once he went back, my pieces come in. He can't punish it, and then he's the one getting punished. So, um, yeah, it's very dangerous. Uh, these these uh, these end game, middle game positions where is there still a lot going on? Like you do have to be careful. Um, and I will say this is some growth that I have exhibited, where I can I can play these positions too. I'm not only an attacker, but basically, okay, we won. Um, I won round four, and then the prophecy was finally here. It was time for me to play Ethan. Um, so small little backstory to this game. Um, <laughs> I was really trying to set him up. Honestly, I was trying to, I'm not going to say do him dirty, because I'm not like cheating or anything, but we had played, okay, so we had played these training games, and the first time I played him in this variation, um, I had missed a win. Like, somewhere early in the opening, I was like, oh my god, if he does the same exact thing, I can just do this, and I win. So I decided to play him again and play the same exact move, and I, and I was like, all right, let me see if he does the same exact thing, because if he does then one day I'm gonna play the right move and get him in a tournament game. And I played him the second time in this position and he did the same thing. So I was like, all right, I got this locked and loaded. Next time we play, I'm gonna do this and um, he's gonna just be kind of finished. But unfortunately, I don't even know if he did this on purpose or not, but he played a different variation. Normally he goes this E6, H6 line in the Night Orf, and this time he went for this um, Knight BD7 line, um, and once he played that and he didn't fall for like the the the, the trap, I was just like, all right. I think he even offered a draw, and I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> maybe he knew. Maybe it's all part of a genius plan or something. But basically, like once he didn't fall for the trap, I was like, all right, I'm cool with the draw. Um, so we took the draw. Um, something kind of funny um, was a couple of my students. Um, they like during lessons that week. They were like. So you drew Ethan in the last round, and I I feel like they were like trying to set up a lecture or something, like I don't know I never really asked them to follow, but I was like yeah I did that's it, <laughs> but you could feel like they were probing in some kind of way like why did you draw in the last round you're not gonna play for the win or like whatever, but it is what it is um and now this is actually okay so first let me talk about um my sensei during the tournament so he actually played I think he. Took a round three by, um, he drew round four, where he was kind of just winning, um, and then he, he, I mean, he just smashed his opponent round five, um, but basically, he ended up getting third place, so it was me, Ethan, first and second, and then he got third, um, but he played pretty well, um, I mean, I pretty much took care of business, and then he's, a, he likes Ethan too, like, he wants him to be GM, he wants him to get better, so he was, like, really happy, um, after, I'm not gonna say really happy, but he was just very content. He was very content after the tournament. 
um, and that's always a good feeling. Um, like sometimes, like like uh, when you're a kid and you do really well on the test, or like I did really good on the SAT, and you can just feel how content your parents are. Um, sometimes with your, when you're with your girlfriend, you have a, a great night or a great date, and you can feel how content they are. It's just one of those like really nice feelings. Um, and it's the same thing with when your sensei is it's just very content. You can kind of just feel it in the energy <laughs> and in the body language and the way they talk. So that's always nice. Um, I was actually telling this to someone after the tournament, but like winning is like a drug. Like alcohol, weed, whatever other, like winning literally, the, like just the feeling of winning is a special type of feeling where it's like, um, it's like being drunk, it's like being high. Like you're just happy, you have all this energy, you just wanna talk. I, I know there's just there's another kid who, uh, he was actually about to withdraw, like round two or something he lost. And I was like, no, 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 you can still go four to five, you play, and if you win, you win, you cash out, you'll be good. He ended up winning the rest of his games, cashing out, and I think he was there, like, talking and just having a good time, just, like, late, late in the tournament. He could have left way early, but you just happy he won, and uh, that's like I'm, what I'm saying. Winning kind of is like a drug, um, so that's uh, always a great feeling to have. Um, but, okay, now this question about... Should you draw in the last round? Um, so, basically, this is the first time I've played Ethan where no one can catch us or no one can pass us. So that is one big consideration. So if they were three people with four out of four, and if I drew and the other person won, they would have got five out of five, then I probably wouldn't have just taken a draw like that. So that's one consideration to, to definitely think about. The other is, I mean, if you guarantee tie for first, um, I mean, I'm playing someone basically the same rating, so I'm not even lose rating. Um, and it's like you did all this hard work. Um, you, it's, I mean, maybe it is kind of coward stuff, but you don't want to take the chance of losing, um, especially when you know it's going to be a hard game. Like beating Ethan is not going to be an easy game. Of course, I do think he's going to be very nervous, and probably he's going to offer a bunch of draws, and I already, I always have a draw. Um, but the way the position was going. It was like a, it was gonna be a night dwarf, and I knew it was gonna be a position where I'm probably gonna be down a pawn, but I'm gonna be checkmating him, and if I don't checkmate him, probably it's gonna be at the point where he's not even gonna take a draw because he's just winning. So keeping that in mind and knowing the nature of the position, I didn't want to go hero mode and be like, okay, well if I win, I win, but if I don't win, I lose, um, and. It's, yeah, it's basically hedging your bets, keeping it simple, nothing crazy. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the the thought behind um, why I took a draw in the last round. <laughs> if, if people think I'm getting older, I'm getting soft. Um, just wait till you see what's happening this summer. There will be a lot of fighting gladiator chess to come for sure. Um, so that's what I was going to say there. Um, apart from that, um, a couple of my students did play in the state championship. I think all three of them gained rating. Um, two of them crossed 1100 um, and honestly, I'm just really proud of those guys. Those guys are playing super well They're putting in the work and they've just been steadily on the uh, It's not a what's it, incline. I mean, you know <laughs> when you say when you say someone's doing bad You say they're on the decline, but when you're saying when someone's doing good I don't think you really say they're on the incline, but yeah, they've, and they've just been steadily increasing um, and um, They know what they're doing. It's to the point where for the most part I trust them not to make any big mistakes <laughs> Uh, or at least like the best way to put it is four to five games they're going to be solid basically one time per tournament they are actually going to do something kind of silly and that is something that i got to kind of fix out of them um but for the most part i can definitely trust my students um a decent amount to say i would say um and i will get into chess training uh and just kind of how my students have been doing um recently so that'll be in its own section <laughs> so celebration weekend, celebration week. Um, so I didn't have too much of a celebration week. Uh, normally I, I, I'm in La La Land about the next uh, week after a tournament like this. Um, but for this one, um, Sunday I kind of chilled. Um, I will say the tournament was on 420 weekend. Um, so it was definitely a, a good weekend to, you know, just chill, relax, <laughs> and eat some good food, uh, all this kind of good stuff. Um, and then, so Monday, I actually, I was, I was really debating, do I completely just do nothing? Or should I go see Sensei and get back in the lab? And, I mean, basically, um, 
I went back to to chess training the next day. Um, Sunday I won the tournament. Monday back in there going through some stuff. Um, but I did take the rest of the week off. Um, honestly, I did have a lot of other stuff going on this week. Um, so that was a big part of why I couldn't really celebrate as much. Um, I did do a little bit of celebrating this past weekend. Um, and this is actually very exciting. Basically, my schedule has really, really opened up. I have way more free time now, and I can really effectively use it on studying, training, and improving. So I'm very, very excited to do that. Um, so as far as celebration week went, um, it was basically the Sunday of the tournament. Monday night, I, I definitely did nothing. <laughs> I uh, What did I do Monday? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know. Monday night, I was chilling. But Tuesday to, to basically Tuesday to Saturday, I was back training and getting work done. Um, Saturday night, I took off too much. <laughs> basically, at 9 o'clock, I was cooked. <laughs> That's what happened uh, Saturday. <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes you celebrate so hard, you don't even get to celebrate, you know? That's a, it's a problem with celebrating too much or so much in a little short time span. So, definitely got to watch out for those kind of things. Um, uh, so... Yeah, so that's about it for the tournament. Now I'm really like training, training. Um, very exciting kind of part of the summer. Basically, summer has officially begun. Um, I'm very excited for that. Um, and okay, so last two things for this, then I'm going to get into my chest training. Um, so EACC 10 is June 1st. We're really, really trying to make June 14, 15 a weekend tournament work. There's a lot of reasons why that would be the perfect date. Um, and... Uh, I think with the state championship, with um, things kind of being busy, we have maybe like 10 to 14 signups for EACC 10. Um, we were really hoping, I mean, last time we had about 20 going into it. Um, but I think basically after the first deadline, that's going to correct itself. Um, the network is 100% growing. The customers are definitely growing. There's a lot more people. Um, so, I mean, once again, I think 60 is going to be the new minimum. Um, and I 100% I believe it can hit 80, 90, 100 for the next one. Um, so that's going to be exciting. Um, but yeah, a lot of things going on in the background, um, stuff that we're, gonna, that we're working on to make the summer hopefully into a successful uh, tournament season. Um, also, just going to be a lot of tournaments for me, for I'm sure the world, for uh, everyone trying to, in Georgia, trying to play out all this kind of stuff. Um, now, one other thing that I want to talk about is we are trying to look into adding chess nights. Um, probably what this is going to materialize into is blitz tournaments or some type of tournament. Um, but we kind of have two venues. One is a bar in East Atlanta. They want to do some kind of chess night thing. We're probably going to turn that into a blitz tournament. And I mean, this is kind of what we've seen. And this is always, this is definitely an interesting thing to think about is, um, we don't want to start off with it being every week, um, because it puts a big burden on it, and for from basically from what we've seen, from what I've seen of running chess club, running tournaments, is um, the first one reception is pretty good, but if you do it every week or you do it too much, it's gonna fade, and once it fades to a certain level, it just becomes a bad look, and then you lost all the momentum that you had. This is a hundred percent I've seen, and then you have to work really really hard to um to get it back or to try to make up for it um and sometimes they don't come back it's honestly kind of like a relationship like man like you got to time it like perfectly like if you guys go too hard too fast now there's all this pressure and then it kind of fades it, but if basically push and pull is kind of the idea <laughs> don't want to sound like some kind of guru here but um, there needs to be some supply and demand. <laughs> That's the way to put it. Um, um, essentially, uh, they got a, absence makes the heart grow fonder. I mean, I'm really spitting out these quotes, um, but it's true. So basically, yeah, we we're gonna start with once a month, start building it uh, once a month for a couple months, see how it goes. And then maybe at some point we upgrade it to twice a month as the demand um, is there. Um, and something that's interesting that was pointed out was this is what we do with our tournaments. We start out once a month, got some demand going. Um, and I think what's going to be very important for this is if we do it once a month, we got to crush it that month. Like we have to make it um, like a super very nice 
very well recepted event like we gotta spare no expense go above and beyond do a bunch of stuff which i think we can do and i think it's gonna be very fun to do um and then boom you chill you wait you you, you get people wanting more you get some buzz in the air um and then you plan it and i think the way we're gonna plan this th these uh quote-unquote chess night on on most likely thursday is it's probably gonna be the thursday before or after our tournament that way we can market it wrap it together um there's already some buzz in the air there's some buzz in literally the area um and i think that is the plan of what we're going to do with this so once again still very baby phase we literally had a meeting about it today and talked about it so um these are just ideas but this seems like the correct direction and is kind of what was agreed upon by all the different parties um now there's another chess night that we're thinking about that we have basically an offer to do um it's um it's a restaurant and what's very i think interesting that i really want to try to do at least is um most of these chess nights are catered to young adults to older people um basically adults um so basically at this restaurant is basically a pizza place and i think if we could cater it to kids this would be almost like a win-win here where it's like we already want to get into scholastics um it's pizza i'm pretty sure they don't serve alcohol there um so this would be kid friendly um and then if we can start running tournaments like and there's a market there that would be boom exactly what we were looking for like basically all the boxes would be checked um so that 100 percent is what we're trying to do with this new place um we're probably going to be meeting with them wednesday to try to set this up but same thing we're probably going to start with once a month build it get a market get people interested and then start scaling up um now okay maybe it's better to do it every week and, and to be like that but this is basically last time we did that this time we are trying this kind of method and um i mean we'll see i mean basically you gather evidence you analyze the position you come up with the with what you think the solution should be and then now you're good to go so yeah that's basically what we're doing we're trying a new idea trying a new method um and i think i think this one i mean once again end of the day as you get older you realize nobody knows what's going on nobody really only the only people who know what's going on, the only people who know what the answer is, are the people who have actually done it multiple times, most likely have failed, have learned from their mistakes, and now they are successful because they've done this. That's what the one thing that I can say I've learned as I got older, trust the people who've actually done it and who've actually failed, and now I should know, okay, this is what you gotta do. Everyone else, people wanna give you advice, random people who think, okay, this is a good idea, this is a good idea. You can listen to them 100%, like you can hear them out, but what they say is not even close to as important as certain people who have actually done it. So that's my little take there. So that's going to be it for the state championship and the business side of um, this podcast. Next, we're going to get chess training, students, and all that kind of good stuff. All right. So now, how did I get the state championship? How, well, what do we do to make this happen? So chess training wise, um, basically, we finished openings a while ago. Um, what we really did the week before was work on calculation and man like these puzzles are not easy or i'm not even, I, honestly i shouldn't even call them puzzles because a lot of them just aren't like black to play and win white to play and win it's like white to play and calculate <laughs> and it's like I mean, sometimes at the end it, i mean okay so the solution is to some of these puzzles is like five pages deep it's like how many times in a chess game have you done five pages of analysis on one position like yeah i definitely understand it's good to go deep and analyze but there is a level where it's too much um but i think what we kind of do is we set a time limit where we, like we never spend like an hour on one of the puzzles like uh i mean let's say somewhere between five to 15 minutes is kind of where we put our ideas together and then we go look at them um and uh i mean you definitely learn a lot and okay this is something that i uh, i have been believing recently um is you don't read to find a specific solution per se like okay sometimes you do but really there's i think i think what's important about the act of reading is to just keep reading and keep adding information to your brain or um you basically you just keep growing it's almost once again i do this a lot but it's like going to the gym you don't just go to the gym once and then boom now you're good to go 
No, you go to the gym pretty much every day. You keep going to the gym day after day after day and get bigger and stronger. Um, and then just you keep doing that again, again, and again. And um, I think reading is a very similar idea. Um, so it's not about, I mean, which books I guess you read are important, but just keep reading. Read more books. The more books you read, the more you're going to learn, the more you're going to know, and the more you're going to, I guess, be ready for uh, what's coming next so um that's uh i think very important now it's okay so something that i want to talk about in the future of training so basically this is training camp like um i have three weeks until my next tournament and like georgia state was kind of a warm-up because i mean no gms were playing it, i mean it was definitely a, a, a decently strong tournament i mean okay let's be honest <laughs> it wasn't like as strong as like the norm tournaments or like world open and stuff so it was a good warm up. It was like a soft warm up where it's nothing too crazy. Um, so the the next tournaments are the big boy tournaments. Um, so, and this is something I've been doing with my students too, but I've been breaking chess down into three phases, opening, middle game, and end game. So during a lesson, during training, during whichever, you want to address every phase of chess. So what, the plan for the next three weeks are is the first hour, maybe two hours of training is going through openings. So we already went through openings, but basically what we're going to do next is we're going to make the final open opening files. So right now we have these huge opening databases with, I mean, I'm not going to say they're, they're, they're like super messy, but there are a lot of extra variations where we're like, Oh, that doesn't work, but we never deleted it. We never pruned it. Um, so that basically the databases aren't 100% clean, where it's like it's only the stuff that we expect to play. A, a lot of them have some extra variations, or maybe it's not clear which variation we ended up going with for our final answer. So we need to add commentary there. So basically, we're going to go through all these files and make the final databases, the clean databases that have every variation and, and, and what should be the, the correct answer of what we're looking for. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing from opening wise. Basically, it's going to be a good reviewing experiment. Um, probably what I'm going to be doing is writing stuff down too on, uh, on, on Google sheets, uh, just to, to, just to have an idea of, um, just to have an idea of conceptually what you want to do. I think this will, um, basically help make review sheets a lot easier too. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing from the opening standpoint. Now, as far as middle game goes, um, we have this Ramesh book, 100%. I mean, we got to finish this book. Um, and then for end games, we have a lot of Dvoretsky. I mean, he's the godfather of end games um, for a reason, pretty much. So that's what um, we're going to do for end game. So basically, every phase. Uh, okay, so actually, this is another kind of important thing that I should mention. Um, on top of going through all the opening files, we're going to be playing games in a lot of these files. A lot of these openings especially the lines where basically it's complicated but we think that there's enough compensation like those kind of positions um, we're gonna actually go ahead and play those positions so that we have actual practice um, in these lines um, so that's what we're gonna be doing um, to actually get practice and reps and also just to feel comfortable in these openings that the ones that we're probably gonna get multiple times um, <laughs> So that's going to be the plan for uh, uh, for training. Um, basically, opening review, book, middle game, book, end game, and then also playing to, for uh, actual practical practice. <laughs> that's a word. Um, and I think another thing about practical practice, <laughs> I need to stop saying practical practice, but another thing about playing these games is like you do need to actually practice playing chess um, and making these reads. And what we're going to do is we're gonna play all these games online. Um, some people would think, hey, you gotta play on the board because that's how you actually get practice, how <laughs> you get practical practice. But uh, the good thing about playing online is all the games are recorded. So I can save all these games and we will have a database. Um, and honestly, like the transition to making a book would be very easy from here. We have all these practice games. We have all these opening files. We have all these opening notes. We have all these review sheets. And um, something that my sensei was talking about was also making a chessable course based off all this information. 
So yeah, I mean, it's, it, a lot of this stuff is like locked and loaded and ready um, for hot off the press. Now it's just like we got. I gotta make GM and we gotta um, really start getting those titles. So this stuff sells, and then who even knows like how much do we actually release? That's a that's a, a conversation that we need to have because um, you don't want to give out too much information, um, but you also want to give out some stuff because gotta make some money, <laughs> make that money. Um, so these are just things to think about. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so basically got this. Okay, so another thing, very important thing about training is uh, I don't think it is productive to train in an altered state of mind. <laughs> it's gonna be the way I'm gonna put it. Um, basically, like sometimes we be chilling while playing, we be um, having a good time. And um, I definitely don't feel like I get the most out of practice when I do that. Um, like sometimes I'll be lazy. Sometimes I'll just be like, all right, whatever. Just do. Let's just do this. Or sometimes I just want to see the answer, because my head hurts. <laughs> so these are all things that I think uh, are important. And um, as far as training goes, when you're training, you train. You go 100%. You go focused. And uh, probably the schedule for the next three weeks is 8 a.m. to 12 with Sensei, pretty much every day. I think Monday is the only day I probably take off just because. Uh, logistically it gets hard because I have a class at 3.30 um, that's kind of far away a, uh, a group class that I teach um, but apart from that I mean, Tuesday to Friday I should pretty much be locked in um, 8 to 12 and uh, I have been working, waking up early um, that's going to be that's the superpower that no one knows if I can wake up early then the world is my oyster um, so that's pretty much I would say the summary of chess training um, the, okay the last thing that I, I do want to add is training matches I, it's going to be important for me to get reps from other people, um, play different people, different styles. Um, I already got some people queued up, basically, who I, I plan on playing. Um, but 100%, yeah, like I, I, I would say two to four times a week, just playing training matches against different people, um, getting practice in these openings, getting practice against certain styles, and also just working on conversion, working on playing chess, working on getting better at playing chess. So. Uh, that's pretty much the training regimen that I, I'm going to be on um, for the the next three weeks. Um, yeah, physically, actually, I should. I was. I'll probably just put that in life, but yeah, okay, I guess I can talk about it. Um, but basically, like I said, eight to twelve is um, training chess. Essentially, twelve thirty to two to three is going to be working out, sauna, gym. Um, another thing that I've been doing. Sometimes I feel like maybe it's not the most efficient use of my time, but I, I just really like basketball. I like playing basketball. I like watching basketball. So every day when I go to the gym, I basically this is what I do. I shoot 25 layups. Well, I make 25 layups. I make 25 um, just very close to the hoop, like just jumpers. Um, then I hit 25 mid-range. I hit 25 threes, and I end every every basketball session. <laughs> so I try to end it with 10 straight free throws in a row, making 10 straight free throws. But I think I've only done it once. Basically, I can do five pretty consistently. And then this has happened multiple times. But I will get to nine free throws in a row. I've made nine. And then I miss number 10. And now it's like I have to start all over again. Because um, I want to make 10 in a row before I go. Um, so I've been doing this on top of like the sauna and the gym. And then that's kind of the, the afternoon workout. And then in the nighttime or the evening time, I will run 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, basically, I'm not going to say work out much. This is going to be more push-ups and squats, dips. Not like the not like gym workout, but just like body weight workout. And then also hit the punching bag downstairs. Um, so that's, that's going to be my morning is chest, afternoon is workout, and then evening is um, cardio. And kind of like body weight exercises, I guess I would I would I would put it. Um, and then as far as food goes, I've essentially given up on eating one meal a day. It's just not gonna work. It's uh, it's not because okay. The problem with eating one meal a day is when you eat, you eat so much that you just fall asleep and you turn into a potato. Um, and I don't want to be potato. Like I don't know how else to say this. <laughs> Being a potato is not fun. So what I've been doing, at least I, I started today is for lunch no carbs pretty much meat broccoli i had coleslaw but coleslaw was very mid 
Uh, but meat, broccoli, it's, I guess probably potatoes is what I'm looking for. That's And then nuts, of course. And then for dinner, um, dinner is probably cardio time where we try to get some cardio. Sorry, not cardio, uh, carbs. So rice, parota, bread, something like that. Um, that's kind of the plan for lunch and dinner. Um, and I think that's that's pretty much chess training. I think that's a lot. So basically, we got four hours a day of chess, evening, matches, playing, um, and then we got the physical side of it too, which don't don't it should not be overlooked. The physical side I think is very important. Like you need to be in condition. You need to have energy if you're going to perform at the highest level. All right. So next, chess students, and then we're just gonna wrap up with life. All right. So chess students. Um, kind of said this before, but honestly, very, very impressed with the recent work of some of these guys. Um, like I said, I just feel like I trust them more. Um, but that's, it's, it's funny I say that because uh, I haven't even really started started the middle game and the end game wave. Um, I mean, I guess this is something that kind of happens when, when people know their openings very well, when they know exactly what to do, exactly what to expect. I think that does build confidence in the way you play. You just know, okay, I'm going to be okay. Um, so it's, it's a different level of trust. Um, it's more of like a, it's more like a memorization, like book smart kind of trust. And the next kind of phase is I got to make these guys street smart where they're just good at chess. Like even if they're worse, I trust them cause I know they, they know how to maneuver their pieces. They know how to make reads. Um, and I mean, I think maybe I, I said this in a different podcast, but like just how I've made opening tests and opening quizzes. Um, that's going to be happening for the middle game too. I think I, 100% I need to make tests and quizzes for the middle game. Um, one thing that I did a lot this week is I went through all the different pawn weaknesses um, that you see in chess. Basically, backwards pawn, isolated pawn, hook pawn, over pushed pawn, um, double pawn. So pretty much all these guys, they, they kind of know how to make the reads on um, is this a weakness and then how do we take advantage of this weakness. So I think that's a um, good positional strat. Um, also, as another thing that I've, I've been doing is um, end game exercises. So, um, and I, I think the best way to do this and what I'm going to do, and I've already started kind of doing, is make it basically a checklist of things that you want, you need to go through, or things that, of all the things that you need to cover. And then when I go through it with a student, boom, check it off, boom, check it off. So now we know everything we've gone through and we know everything that we need to go through. And I think these are this is a very important um, thing to do with these guys. Because um, right now it's basically I'm trying to hit everything, but I don't know if I'm hitting everything. But when we if we do it that way, um, then for sure I will know that I'm hitting everything. Um, and I'll know what I need to go. So basically it's having a big plan. I have this whiteboard. I did write down a lot of stuff. Um, but what makes it kind of difficult or tricky is a lot of these guys are at different levels. So I have to also adjust for the level. Um, and especially now, all these guys are starting out at different levels. So basically, I have to make um, a plan for every single level. Um, I mean, yeah, it's not easy, but uh, it is what it is. Um, on top of endgame exercises, um, for example, for endgames, it's like, Philidor, Lucina, Rook and Corner Pawn, Queen pawn, Queen and Pawn Endgames. And this is probably something that I should definitely be going through with my sen my sensei um, of all endgames that people need to know. Uh, we can go through and make files, and then basically if we go through it, I will know how to properly teach someone how to go through it. Um, so actually, I'll probably definitely circle that down um, and go through that with those guys, uh, with sensei first and then, and then these guys. Um, and then another couple um, I, things that are very important and something that I've actually been asked a lot recently is converting winning positions. Um, it's a problem from every single level. I, I almost would say it's harder at the higher level than it is at the lower level. The lower level, is, it's actually funny. Like these guys kind of just, I would say, fold or they fall for a tactic. But at the high level, like these guys don't give up and then they, they just keep coming at you. So converting slightly better or even just like winning positions against strong players. That's, that's, uh, we basically, I need to make exercises that will help my students and myself actually practice these conversions. Um, and then CCT. So CCT is another very, um, I think good exercise. Um, and it's actually something that I've started to do with every single one of my students. 
beginning of the lesson, it's the first thing we do is CCT. So basically CCT is going through every piece and looking at the checks, captures, and threats. And I basically, I want to, I want to drill these guys into doing it really fast. Um, and the way to do it is you start left to right, bottom to top, you look at the piece and then you say every check, capture, threat, next piece, check, capture, threat, next piece. And basically if you can just train yourself to do that a lot, a lot, you will start seeing everything on the board. Um, so that's been, that's basically the warm up that I have uh, created for all my students. Um, so those are the things to add. Um, opening wise, so this is actually kind of interesting, but basically the openings for under 1400 are amazing. They're good to go. They're complete. The openings above are a little bit more chaotic just because this is when I start letting my students choose what they want to play. And some or some of these guys already had different openings that they were playing. Like dragon is a is a common one. Like I don't really play the dragon, but um, I mean I can teach them to a level, but not quite to the level I can teach them like Sveshnikov or the French or other stuff. So um, I think go, reviewing with uh, Sensei um, and maybe that's what we start doing tomorrow, going through all the sidelines because um, because. Uh, those are things that I can work on with these guys. And uh, I mean, definitely um, I'm going to see as well. So, um, I mean, basically it kind of is circle of life. I go through with sensei, I learn it and then I teach. And then I, when I teach, I learn it better and I practice it. So, I mean, that's kind of like what kind of happens. That's, that's why we train. That's why we do this. And uh, that's why I think being taught and teaching is very important. I don't just have a teacher and don't just teach people do both. Because it does really open your eyes to um, to uh, the perspective from both perspectives. Um, okay, so last thing I'm going to say for students is okay. So I have basically two group classes. Um, one of them is basically a bunch of middle schoolers, um, and I think essentially I've gotten these guys down as it not like down as in the sense where it's like I feel like the whole time that we were working together we are pretty productive, um, and. I think for a little bit, it felt like it was drifting a tiny bit or where it wasn't as efficient. But once again, having a plan, having a checklist of things to go through, uh, I think has been really good for, for this class. Um, but then the new challenge is I have now a group of elementary kids, um, basically third to fifth grade. Um, and it's not that I, they're not learning or that they're not having fun. <laughs> it's sometimes that they're having too much fun and it's like I lose them for a bit. Um, so the, the middle school group I think is good. It's now the next group that I need to be more efficient with. And what I'm really thinking for these guys is handouts, handouts that they can look at, that they can go through and that they can, uh, say that they've learned things and take notes. Um, cause another thing with these group classes is I'm, I'm, I really enjoy using spreadsheets and taking notes that way for people to, um, for my students to learn. But in group settings, spreadsheets is not as efficient as one-on-one, -on -one, 100%. Like, when you have four people typing, it's a little bit slower, um, and you can't just access it. Like, another thing is, like, online almost is easier, because I think online one-on-one, -on -one, I will say, is pretty easy, because you have easy access, and you can kind of control things pretty fast and easy. Um, but, uh, yeah, the group classes, um, spreadsheets is definitely not as efficient. So, I mean, of course, tests are still efficient, but I think some type of handout, and once again, these handouts are going to directly translate into, into a book. So it's not like, uh, it's not like that's not a useful thing to have anyway. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's my chess students. Um, okay. Also another thing is a slight new wave of students. Um, something that I have seen is during the summer, um, you definitely do get a couple new students. All right, school's done. Got some free time over the summer. Trying to do some chess here. So have gotten maybe like three to five more new students. Um, just with something that I've noticed. Um, and I mean, once again, they're coming at a good time, except for the fact that I'm trying to play. Um, but I've, that's a, I think that's a very important part of having a plan. Um, it's so it's not as much pressure on you to to learn or create material when you already have it when you already have when you already know exactly what you're going to do exactly what you're trying to do um so i think these are all really good really important 
And uh, once again, students are getting better. Um, I'm definitely more um, confident in them. I trust them more, like I was saying. Um, and I mean, still work to do, but it's good work overall. So that 100% is good. All right, so lastly, just gonna go through some random things in life um, and that should be good to go. Last part of the podcast for today is life. So first thing that I will go over is Shogun. This TV show is officially over. I actually didn't know it was a miniseries. I was expecting season one, two, three, four, and all this kind of stuff, but it's just one season. Um, overall, I would say I was, it was good. It was pretty cool to watch. It was overall, I would say, aesthetically kind of beautiful. Um, I will say <laughs> they kind of focus on the, the women or the girls in the show for a bit, and then everyone was just trying to kill themselves. Like, I don't know if this is like... I mean, I, I know it's kind of a stereotype, but I don't know if it's this prevalent. But at some point, just everyone in the show is just trying to commit suicide. And it's not like they're committing suicide in the, in the sad way. They're all like in the honorable, noble way. Um, but at some point, it's like, yo, you're still trying to commit suicide. Like, I don't know if that's really a good thing. Um, I'm trying to think what was the moral of the story? What was the, there was something really beautiful at the end. I mean, one is you don't give up. Um, and I mean, I guess the big idea is having a plan. Like you need to have a plan and sometimes you need to buy yourself some time to have a plan. But, um, yeah, plan is very important. Um, yeah, I mean, overall, I mean, there were some actually very funny, cool scenes. Um, (laughs) just comical scenes. Hopefully, hopefully at some point, um, over the summer, I have time to make a lot of videos. There are a lot of videos that I want to make. Like one video that I really want to make is um, like a a hierarchy hierarch list, a list of how like uh, the NBA teams I enjoyed betting with, or how good were the NBA teams, a a ranking list of all the NBA teams and how much money um, I made with them, or how uh, how it was betting on certain teams. Like for example, my favorite team. The greatest NBA team to bet on is 100%, without a doubt, the Detroit Pistons. You just know, I mean, they lost 29 games in a row or something, and I was on all 29 of those games. I've been saying, if the Detroit Pistons lose, I make money. That is one of my strategies, and I will swear by it, and I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. The Detroit Pistons will be bad for a long time. I do not have to worry about that, and that is why I love the Detroit Pistons. Even when they win, I can tell this is when they're going to win. Also, another thing that the Pistons do really well is they always let their opponents score a lot of points. So a lot of times the overs will hit. So not only do you get the win of fading the Detroit Pistons, but you also get the win of hitting the over because they ca- <laughs> because the point <laughs> basically the opponents can score so many points against them. And then Detroit would do a decent enough job of scoring points. So, like, you did get enough to hit the over on, I think, multiple occasions. So, yeah, Pistons were great. Teams I hated betting, the Chicago Bulls were one. The Raptors for a sec until they gave up. After Once the Raptors gave up, they became a money-making team. Um, the Thunder were one of the, my favorite teams. Let me see. I'm going to take a look. NBA team list. <laughs> uh... Okay, yeah, yeah. let me let me go through this because I, I should be able to answer this pretty fast. Celtics were great, though they would let you down in certain spots. They would just randomly lose to to nobodies. Um, but overall, Celtics were great. Warriors, you don't mess with. Warriors were just chaos. You never knew when they were supposed to lose, they win. When they're supposed to win, they lose. Don't mess with the Warriors. The Clippers started out really good, and then they became a falling knife. Brooklyn Nets once again started out good and became a falling ni- knife. Knicks just had injuries, um, but by the second half of the season, the Knicks were uh, very reliable. Um, Lakers, no, nah, Lakers, Lakers actually, no, nah, I'll, I'll take that back. Lakers were pretty good. They also were over Kings. Like, they would get overs a lot. They would always allow points. Um, but you got to be careful. Against good teams, you probably want to fade them. But they would beat the bad teams for the most part. Sixers, when they had Embiid, they were great. After they had, after Embiid got hurt, they were they were tough. Not worth it. Phoenix Suns had moments, but also definitely could let you down. Kings, Kings, I do not mess with. Kings were one of those teams like I could never, I could never get the Kings. Hawks, Hawks were, Hawks were, 
No, Hawks are bad. Hawks are bad. Because, like, once again, they could beat anyone, but they lose They <laughs> lose to most anyone. <laughs> That's the Hawks. <laughs> they could beat anyone, but they lose to mostly everyone. <laughs> that is the Hawks. Uh, Cavs were kind of mid. Hornets. You, Hornets were pretty reliable. Like, you wanted... Like, Hornets were dollar store Detroit Pistons, where, like, you needed them to lose, they would lose, and they would let the other team cover. Once again, every once in a while... They would overperform or they would make some magic happen. But uh, for the most part, uh, Hornets were bad. The Heat, man, the Heat are my team. And they broke my heart so many times this season. At some point, I just stopped betting them. I mean, literally today, they broke my heart. That's how much that I, okay. And the thing is with the Heat, like, you know they're going to lose, but you know they can win. They basically are, like, the, the Hawks are dollar store Miami Heat. Like, you can trust the Heat a little bit more, but overall, it's the same thing. They just, they have the ability to play well, but they won't. And then these guys were also under kings, where, like, they would get under so much, and I would get my heart broken so much. So, like, honestly, the Miami Heat are on the do not bet list until until otherwise. Like, that's for sure. Magic were good up until recently. Um, and even then, Magic actually, Magic are good now. They have okay. Once again, every team pretty much has their moments where they let you down, <laughs> but overall, pretty good. Um, Pacers, I li- actually Pacers. Pacers recently, I've liked a lot, but they they had these weird games like where they just would not score or they would lose to at randoms. Um, Pacers, yeah, could lose to anyone, um, but they could also beat anyone. Um, Bucks were fade hard list. They, there was a stretch where the Bucks lost to the Raptors, the Grizzlies, the Wizards, and then they beat the Celtics, and they beat someone else good. And I think they beat the Magic. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, you lost to the three worst teams, and then you beat the... Like, you already know I was 0 for 5 on those those five games. Like, I thought they were going to win. I thought they were going to win. And then I was like, okay, if they're losing to these guys, they're not going to beat the best team. And then, boom, they beat the best team. So, yeah, Bucks were just a mess. A huge, huge mess. Um, Wizards, I mean, you just knew they were going to be bad, but for the most part, didn't touch. Nuggets were pretty good. The Nuggets would play close to some bad teams, 100%. Um, Mavericks, Mavericks honestly were one of my favorite teams of the year, but during playoffs, it has not been the same. Playoffs has been a roller coaster ride. Um, I mean, I, I mean, it goes hand in hand. The Clippers were a roller coaster ride. Dallas versus the Clippers, a roller coaster ride. It's one of those you just kind of just stay away from. Timberwolves had injuries. That's a problem, but they were overall, I would say, okay. Um, Rockets could be good. They were really good at home. Um, and then Grizzlies, I loved. Love the Grizzlies. Basically, Dollar Store Pistons, <laughs> Portland Trail Blazers. Also, they were thrown in my set early on when they were trying. But at some point, they gave up. And then, money-making team. Pelicans were a mess. They, they they had their moments when... If Zion is playing, if everyone is playing, the Pelicans are a good team. But if anybody is missing, if someone is injured... I mean, pretty much they need Zion. But if they are if they are going through injuries, they anything can happen. And you don't know if it's over, under, whatever direction. Spurs, honestly, I, I, I actually like the Spurs a lot. They basically would play they actually ended up with one of the worst records but they had a lot of close games against some of the best players or best teams so um spurs i did like and then the jazz for the most part were just a bad team um in the beginning of the season they were able to beat good teams they actually have a good roster they just gave up or had a bunch of injuries so that's pretty much the, the nba video that i'm going to make um nba playoffs wise um Anthony Edwards has been he literally looks like young Michael Jordan like I, th- I thought that he was getting overhyped for a bit and then I watched him beat the Suns and it was really sad because if the Suns had won would have made a bunch of money and the Suns were down 3-0 at home you would think that they at least do not get swept up 5 at halftime up pretty much the majority of the game and then Edwards just went off. And, man, that guy can dunk. When he jumps, it's like, yo, watch out. Like, clear the runway. Like, you don't want to be there, you know? Um, so, Edwards, honestly, I think is the future of the league. 
he'd be talking like Kobe. He'd be talking like, like saying the right things. They were like, um, do you want to celebrate winning this series after game three? And he was like, it ain't over till it's over. Um, they were like, how do you want to win? He's like, I want to kill everything in front of me. Like that man is out there to eat. That man is out there to put in that work. Um, low key, I would put the Timberwolves as one of the favorites to win the championship this year. Just off of what I saw in that series and those games, like I definitely think they have, um, they have the uh, the ability to win a championship this year. Um, Heat game two. <sighs> so, it it was one of the greatest games or overperformances that I've seen. The Heat game two beat the Celtics. Heat without Jimmy Butler are just not a very good team, or they're just like they don't have the talent that the, that the Celtics have. But the thing is, after game two, I mean, they've just played so bad. And it's not even that the Celtics have played really well or anything. The Heat just are missing shots. They're just not making shots. They're not playing well. It's so hard to watch as a team, as a fan. They'd be getting plus 10 point spreads, and it's not even close. They'd be down 20 for three-fourths of the game. It's, it's, it's just, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. And it's, when it's your team, it hurts the most because... You already want them to win. You want to root for them. Now they're giving you this trap 10-point line where it's like, ooh. I mean, they're going to at least keep it within 10 points. But deep down in your heart, you know. And this is something that happens with a lot of bets or a lot of different times in life. You know what's going to happen. Like, in your heart of hearts, in your intuition, you know, okay, this is probably what's going to happen. Sometimes you don't know. But a lot of times you do. But you get this misguided view or you, you let your heart make the decision. And then boom, now now you gotta pay the consequences. And paying the consequences, low key, are the worst. Um, so he probably on the do not bet list or the fade list. Honestly, I'm just not gonna bet them. Like, I already know if I'm gonna bet the Celtics next game and the Heat are gonna win on the road. So, <laughs> uh, so okay, this will cheer up my mood a little bit. Um, and this is something I think that's very, very annoying. Um, Oh yeah, let me let me turn this back. Um, these superstars, these six eight huge black guys, these seven two huge black guys, are always complaining about fouls. They always every you see it every time they they go for a shot, whether they make it or they miss it, they throw their hands in the air like, oh my god, I can't believe it. No foul, like is everything a foul? Like if you act like every single play is a foul, the ref is not going to give you these calls. There's a level of like, I don't know, respect or like accountability or the boy who cried wolf. Like you can't just keep calling for fouls and you are literally an alpha male, a big, huge, like you are genetically gifted and you're out here just complaining about fouls every single play. It gets very, it gets kind of annoying. It gets kind of repetitive. Um, so yeah, I mean, for the most part, these guys have not been rewarded and I mean, sometimes they do get rewarded and it's just so hard to watch. It's like foul call, foul call, foul call. So that is definitely something that's kind of annoying. Um, and these guys need to, uh, these guys need to uh, just be big, strong men <laughs> is the best way to put it. Um, all right. So last, last couple of things, Ryan Garcia, um, <laughs> Ryan Garcia versus Devin Haney was a boxing fight that happened. Um, I think maybe two weeks ago at this point. Um, I thought it was on 420. It was actually the weekend of the state championship. Man, I had I had Garcia by knockout at plus 600 or something. Dude literally knocked him out like four different times. The ref just kept him up. But the bigger thing was, and this I thought was pretty cool, is he kind of faked being crazy. He faked all these like conspiracy theories and how he's like insane and all these videos. Apparently, they're all pre-recorded. He had this huge marketing plan of, okay, I'm going to do this and get everyone thinking that this is what's actually happening. Um, and uh, he actually even like chugged... Um, "Quote unquote beer on the weigh-in scale, um, and basically what happened was uh, the the Vegas odds shifted in his or shifted against him, in the sense that um, he went from plus four hundred to like plus five, plus six hundred, um, which is kind of insane because he bet two million dollars on himself, which basically at the end cashed out for twelve million dollars. So on top of making millions and do- millions of dollars off the fight." 
itself, he also bet on himself and made another $14 million. Um, so he did pretty well. And uh, this, this this marketing idea of faking like you're crazy and just uh, skewing the odds in your side, like even I think his opponent at some point didn't really take him seriously. He was just like, all right, this guy's just being all crazy. Um, he actually, he missed weight by I think one and a half pounds. And basically he made an agreement that he would pay $500,000 to his opponent for every half pound that he missed so he also had to pay 1.5 million dollars just because he missed weight but end of the day like he kind of just destroyed Devin Haney and he made all that money um so he's pretty much on top of the world I'm kind of happy for him I, I think he's a fun guy um <laughs> it's probably too much fun um and I mean he'd definitely be a little bit crazy um but that's kind of why we like some of these people am I right or am I right all right, so the last thing that I'm talking about, um, I'm not going to go through all of UFC 301. Basically, we just had UFC 300, and UFC 301 is next week, came out of nowhere. Um, and what I will say is it is one of the middest cards I've ever seen in my life. This is not a great card. Um, I mean, the title fight is pretty much insane, to put it the least. I don't know why Steve Urseg got the title shot <clears throat> against Pantoja. But it's basically in Brazil. Um, I mean, very low, big name worth. Um, but yeah, the UFC 301 is literally this weekend on Cinco, uh, Cinco de Mayo too, I think, which is kind of insane. Um, and then the last, the last thing is with the su- with summer officially beginning, with my celebration of the state championship, I took some time, and this is part of my vacation, part of my 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 fun week. I cleaned everything. <laughs> clean my room, clean my couch, clean my bathtub, clean my car, cleaned my gym bag, clean my backpack. I literally cleaned my backpack, cleaned literally everything. That's one of those things. Like I just love to clean. When I got some free time, I'm going to clean. It feels productive. It feels nice. It feels like I'm making progress. Love it. I can't say it enough. Love, love cleaning. And that was one of my guilty pleasures from the week. So that is it for episode 50. Pretty cool that 50 was the one that I got. I ended up getting the state championship and talking about it in. Um, and that's it. That's it. Ne- next thing we know, we moving forward. And uh, summer has begun. So if there's one last thing I can tell you guys, summer has begun. Have some fun. Get out into the sun. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I won't say the last part. <laughs> have some fun that's the best way to put it um and i will see you guys later peace